Bless the Lord. Welcome to part two of the lesson, What is Happening in the World Now? Last week, we looked at part one, or rather, and on March 29th, I, I looked at part one, and on April 5th, I did part two of this lesson. Uh, I did not record the lesson at the time, so I'm recording the lesson now so that it can be shared with everyone. So let's get into it. So the topic of the lesson is what's happening in the world now. Again, we seek to answer the questions, the following questions, is the world about to end? Why is God alone COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic? And what should be the Christian's or the church's response? Now in, the, in part one, I looked at the, the first question. I answered the first question, is the world about to end? And so we looked at the fact that we're living in the last days and the last days refers to the last dispensation of time before the return of Jesus Christ to earth. Now, the return of Jesus Christ will be seven years after an event called the rapture, an event in which Christians will be ushered out of this earth. Dead Christians will, will rise and those who are alive will be changed and they'll all be caught up with Jesus in the air. When Jesus comes back physically to the earth, then everyone will be with him. Uh, the rapture is imminent and can happen at any time. As a matter of fact, as I've said several times in doing these lessons, that the, the apostles, and when you look at the early church, they were really expecting Jesus Christ to come back in their time. If you look at Paul and his writings, uh, Peter, they were all expecting that they would see the second return of Christ in their time. And so it could have happened almost 2,000 years have passed, and no one knows the day or the hour, but God knows. And so we look at the fact that we can know the plan of God uh, through predictive prophecy, but we can't be bogged down with the details. As I've just mentioned, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. Some people try to predict the exact date that, that Jesus is coming back, and this is wrong. So what God has done is given us a general plan, but we don't have the specifics. But when the disciples asked the question, Jesus gave them some signs, some things that would be happening in the last days or the last period of time. And we see from the scriptures, uh, from evidence of our time, that all these things have happened and are happening. And COVID-19 is but just one of these um, last age events. Amen. Not the first, bless God, uh, pandemic and not the deadliest thus far. So let's get into the rest of the, the lesson, part two. And I'll go straight to part two. Now, the key scripture for this part that I used uh, is Isaiah 45, 5 to 13. It says, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, He has no hands. Woe to him who says to his father, What are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus the Lord, thus says the Lord, 
the Holy One of Israel and his maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. You command me. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hands, stretch out the heavens and all their hosts I have commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. So from the scripture here, we get the impression that God is in charge, that God has created all things. Amen. We can't direct him. God is the one who directs the affairs of men. He rules in the kingdom of men. And in his realm of operation, in his kingdom, which includes everything that exists, amen, God determines what happens and we can't strive with him. Bless God. And so the, the, the onus is upon us to really accept God's plan and work with the will of God. Now, why is God allowing the COVID-19 pandemic? And I'll put forth a few thoughts. I can't give you every possible reason. Uh, I'm going to look at some things, but this is not an exhaustive list. But some important reasons I believe that this pandemic may be happening at this time. Now, why does God allow disasters for that matter? Any disaster, uh, famine, flood, amen, or anything that, that, that takes lives and put men in distress. Well, there are several reasons that God would allow something like COVID-19, including, and I'm going to look at these, these reasons, these three. One, man's sin. Two, discipline, God's discipline. Three, judgment. So one reason why we're experience COVID, experiencing COVID-19 is because of man's sin. When Adam sinned, Amen. Bless God. It caused several things to be unleashed on the earth and on mankind. So let's look at the scriptures. The scripture in Genesis 2 verse 17 says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so death comes as a consequence of man's sin. When Adam sinned, death entered the human race. Amen. And all the agents of death, disease, you know, various sicknesses, aging, etc. We're experience all, experiencing all these things, where you experience diseases uh, because of the sin of man. So in a general sense, the only reason we can one reason why we experience things like COVID-19 is because man has fallen, man has sinned. The Bible says, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I command you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the, the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so, as a consequence of man's sin, uh, a curse came upon man, but a curse came upon the earth as well. And so the entire nature of the earth changed when man sinned. And so the, 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 the man now had to toil and work hard to feed himself. However, the earth would not necessarily be that cooperative. There would be thorns and thistles, amen. And so the ground would be difficult to, 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 to plow, to cultivate, amen, crops, uh, those are the consequence of man's sin. The entire nature of the creation changed. The nature of animals. Animals became aggressive towards men. Bless God. And, and many things entered the earth. You know, sicknesses, etc. The Bible says, and that's why Job says, man who's born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. 
And so because of man's sin or sojourn on the earth, it's full of trouble. Trouble comes to everyone, rich, poor, amen, black, white, no matter where you're from, your station in life, we all face some trouble at some point in time. And we see that some people believe that if you get rich, then your troubles are finished. But, you know, look at how many rich people are on drugs because they are so unhappy because they have troubles. How many rich people commit suicide because they have troubles. And the Bible says, for we know that the old creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And so therefore, the entire creation has been impacted by man's sin. Man got dominion over the earth and his sin, not just affected him, didn't just affect him, it, it affected the entire creation. And so the, the bottom line, the point is that man's sin has impacted the entire creation. It has impacted the vegetation, the animals, weather systems. And I don't believe we'd have things like hurricanes, tornadoes, you know, these various things, uh, if man had not sinned. And so one reason why we have diseases and, and, and you know, pandemics and, and various disasters, really, is because of the sin of man, in a general sense, the sin of man. But another reason why God allows these things is discipline. Because God uses nature, the forces of nature and the things created, things on the earth to accomplish his, his purpose. And, um, and when we talk about discipline, not punishment, you know, discipline particularly for the Christian. Discipline means, you know, correction, chastisement, you know, getting us to line up uh, to, to produce the character that God wants in us. Just as how we discipline our children. So discipline has as its basis love. So if we look at the scripture, the Bible says, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, just as we have now, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so sometimes when people are turned to wicked ways, and, and the people of God, you know, things will happen in the land. And the, the scripture tells us plainly, it says clearly here, what is mentioned, amen, in particular, is pestilence, amen. That's one of the things that are mentioned. The Lord says, or send pestilence among my people. So sometimes God will send pestilences, diseases, outbreak of diseases, plagues, and the essence is to bring back man to God, to get man focusing on God. And this is chastisement, the discipline of God. Amen. The, the scripture goes on to say, bless God, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep, bless God, your word. And so therefore, these are, 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 are some things. Amen. The nature of human beings, we tend to be rebellious. We tend to go astray, and sometimes God has to bring us back in line, and, and sometimes God has to do things to get us where we should be. Amen. So these things sometimes are because of the discipline of God. And you have and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons, as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. And so it's a nat natural part of the, the Christian experience. Just as though we chase our children, you know, the Lord will chase us out of love to get us to achieve, to accomplish, to the place, amen, where he wants us to be, amen. More scriptures in Romans, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And so the bottom line is, this is where chastisement is concerned. Bless God, the bottom line is these things are for good 
Amen. To the Christian. Amen. And so there is good for Christians coming out of, of COVID. So God's discipline leads to saints, the perfection of the saints. It leads saints to spiritual maturity. God's discipline leads sinners to God. Many people get saved because they are, they are exposed to, to situations of discomfort, of anxiety, of pain and suffering. And bless God, where discipline is concerned, we have seen, even over the spirit, I saw a report from the UPC where many people over the spirit have gotten saved, have gotten baptized, have been filled. In my own experience, the church that I pastor, there are so many people who want to come to church, you know, people who used to, you know, scoff at our invitation. And so I've seen many, I've seen a change in the type of preaching, you know, in the apostolic arena. And otherwise, people are more heaven focused, you know, right now. And so I believe that God is doing our work. He's saving us. You know, there's a disciplinary process that's taking place. And the final a possible reason that I look at is judgment. And from time to time, God uses things like these, amen, to judge individuals, to judge, amen, nations, to judge the world indeed. So, amen. So, where God's judgment is concerned, in Genesis 18.20 the Bible says, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. So judgment came on Sodom, amen, and Gomorrah, amen, bless God. Hail of fire rain down from heaven, a natural process, so to speak, that God used, amen, and destroyed that city because their sin was grievous. And sometimes people are destroyed because amen their sins amen have come full amen they are full before god for i will pass through the land of egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of egypt both man and beast and against all the gods of egypt i will execute judgment i am the lord and so when god delivered the children of israel from egypt he caused 10 plagues upon the land of Egypt and he judged the land of Egypt, amen, via these things and judged the gods of Egypt. Bless God. The scripture says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So what we see is that the city of Nineveh was judged. They were going to be destroyed because they were a wicked city. And the Bible, we know that went, they repented and the judgment was stayed. About a hundred years after the city, you know, they relapsed uh, back to their wicked ways and were destroyed. In Samuel, it says, again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And, you know, this is an, always an amazing scripture. God was angry with the children of Israel and he sought an occasion against them. And the Bible said he moved. David against them to say, go, number, Israel, and Judah. And so the Lord, going out to verse 15, that was verse 1, the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time, from Dan to Beersheba, that's the entire length and breadth of Israel, bless God, and 70,000 men of the people died. So the God sent a plague and 70,000 people died. And this was a means of judgment. Amen. And we know that story ended up. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Okay, I, I think I put that twice. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, I... Bless God. King Nebuchadnezzar said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. 
and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and even times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And so Nebuchadnezzar was a mighty and great king. Babylon was, was a magnificent kingdom. And so we see that what Nebuchadnezzar did was that he took the glory, he did not acknowledge God, and so God judged him for a time. He lost his mind, he was out in the field with animals, his, his hair uh, was grown up, his nails, etc. And then when we read that story, he came back to his right mind and he acknowledged God. And so therefore, sometimes uh, things will happen, judgment will fall upon men for them to acknowledge and recognize who God is. Amen. And the Bible says, So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, The voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately the angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And so we see where Herod, Another heathen king did not give glory to God, even though this man was not a servant of God. I want you to understand that all creation, amen, everything was created to bring glory to God. You know, um, in, in Revelation 4, about 11, you know, all things were created to give him glory. All things were created for his pleasure. And so, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who got a chance to come back, in this case, the judgment upon Herod was final. Judge Herod was killed because he did not give God the glory. And so apart from the final judgment that is to come, that's a great white throne judgment, God dispenses judgment from time to time as he sees it necessary. And so each dispensation ends in judgment and there's a final judgment that will take place before we enter into the rest of eternity. But separate and apart from that, God as the righteous judge reserves the right, it's his prerogative, to dispense judgment as he sees it fit from time to time. Judgment on individuals, judgment on a group, judgment on nations, judgment on the world. And so these are possible reasons why we are experiencing COVID-19 at this point. Three possible reasons. Man's sin generally, that has allowed these things. God's disciplinary process and judgment. And God definitely can use one event. Amen. In Jamaica, we say, use one stone to kill two birds. Amen. But God can use one event to accomplish several purposes. And there may be more things, God knows. But I believe that these are, are three important reasons and that they are in line with, with scriptures. Now, what should be the Christians or the church's response? In light of what is said, in light of what is said in terms of the end time and why this COVID could possibly be, be happening, what should be our response as the church? You know, many people are saying many things. Some people are saying, well, we should not obey the edicts of the land. We, we should continue with church, etc." And so I'm going to look at what should be our response. And um, I'm going to look at what was the church's response, the Pentecostal, Pentecostal's response in the, in the 1918 um, Spanish flu pandemic outbreak. Amen. Which would see that similar... They, they were in a similar situation as to what we are experiencing now. So the Christian's response. Well, the first thing is that the Christian should pray. That's the first response. And, and that's the first response. God wants us to pray. If we look at some scriptures, the Bible says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so the first thing, in every situation, we should not worry. We should not despair, but we should pray. God, what is it that you are doing? What should, what should happen? Amen. It says, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
So we should pray and we should pray that God's will be done, that his purposes be accomplished. Uh, the Bible says, preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. We should preserve, the, pray that our souls be preserved. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we should pray for ourselves, but we should pray for our fellow saints. Amen. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we should be praying for all men, for leaders, for all who are sick, for everyone. And so to summarize, based on those scriptures, we should pray, one, for God's will to be done or accomplished at this time in COVID-19. God has a purpose for this period of time and what's happening. And we should be praying that his will be done. Two, we should pr pray for the preservation of our souls. But we should also pray for the brethren, the Christian brethren. We should pray for our leaders, natural leaders, spiritual leaders. You know, in our lifetime, none of our leaders have gone through any situation like this. You know, people are using words like the new normal, etc. But we want our secular leaders to make the right decisions because what they do will impact us. And we want our spiritual leaders to guide the church. Amen. Uh, as it should be according to the will of God. And finally, we need to pray for all men, those who are impacted. So many people have died. You know, over 140,000 people have died. Uh, over 2 million people have been in infected. And so we need to pray. And the disease continues to rage on. Let's pray for nations that they made the right decision. Decisions. Amen. To protect the people. Let's pray for men, for the mercy of God, for them to stay the plague and for healing upon the peoples. Amen. For comfort for those who have lost loved ones. Amen. The world truly will never be the same. Bless God, but prayer can accomplish much. The second response is to rejoice. In all situations, God is to receive honor and glory. No matter what's happening, he deserves praise. And, and our worship to God is not dependent upon our, our circumstances, our physical situation, but our worship is dependent upon who God is. We, are, we worship him because he's worthy, he's worship. Amen. Bless God. So the scripture says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And so this is a trying time for the entire world, but Paul in writing to Christians, because as Christians, we have hope and we know that all things work together for good. We should expect trials and we should rejoice, amen, in times like these. The Bible says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we should always remain a thankful spirit. Thankful, amen, bless God. Even though we have been impacted, we can't go out as we like, amen. And some of us may be sick. We should be thankful for life. And for those who have lost loved ones who are saved, amen, we should be thankful that they have gone on to be with the Lord. Amen. And even when the situation, people died who have not been saved, you know, God is still worthy to be praised. So the thing is that God hates murmurs. If we look at Israel's uh, experience, their sojourn through the wilderness, amen, they spent so many years, 40 years, because of their murmuring and complaining against God, they're backsliding. God hates murmurers. God loves uh, a spirit of rejoicing. And if we believe in him and we trust him, then we will not murmur. <clears throat> now, the third thing is that we need to maintain hope. As Christians, we're not hopeless. And the scripture says, or the scriptures say, well, first in Matthew 28, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end. And so a part of the Great Commission 
you know, we, we, we tend to focus on the baptism, etc. But a part of the Great Commission, God says, teach people that I'm with you always. So the saints, we know that God is with us, even to the end of the age. We see all these things that are happening and we are in the last age and we're approaching the end of this age, I believe. But we should be, we have hope because God is with us. The Bible says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, the, the King James Version says, hope make it not a shame. If we have our hope in God, we will not be disappointed. And so let us continue to hope. The Bible says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer. This put them together. This is a time of, of testing and we should be patient. But the Bible says we have reason to rejoice. Our hope brings rejoicing. And so at this time, we should continue steadfastly in prayer prior for what whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope and so we have the examples from the scriptures and i'm going to show you some examples not in the scriptures but what happened in 1918 so we have hope now may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, you know, our hope will bring joy. Bless God. And the final thing that we should do as Christians, so we should pray. Amen. As I said, uh, we should rejoice. We should have hope. But finally, we should obey authority. And the scripture says, well, first, the spiritual leaders, we need to obey them. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So the first thing at this time, as our spiritual leaders give us instructions, we should obey. You know, the only reason for not obeying is if we are told things to do that are contrary to what God has revealed in his word. Amen. And likewise, we must obey secular authority. So the Bible says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So therefore our prime minister, Andrew Holness, could not be prime minister unless God has appointed him or allowed him to occupy this position. President Trump could not be the president of the US unless God has allowed him. And so we need to submit ourselves and to subject ourselves to the authority. It says, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So if we resist the authority, we are resisting God. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you not want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. And so... For he is the God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And so if we disobey the edicts of the land, we will be imprisoned. We will be persecuted. But rightly so. You know, Peter says that we should suffer as Christians, not as those who do wrong. The scripture goes on in verse 5. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience's sake. How can our conscience be clean if we disobey what the authority of the land has said. You know, we can't be guiltless. It says, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom, to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fair to whom fair, honor to whom honor. And so we should be obedient to the authority of the land and we should be obedient to spiritual authority. Once they're not telling us uh, to do anything that is contrary to the word of God. Once they are not stopping us from practicing our faith, amen, then we ought to obey the authorities. So let's look at what happened in 1918 to 1920 in the Spanish flu outbreak, amen. So if you remember from last week, amen, the, the, the outline give you some background in Starting at about 1906 and running up to 
about 1915, um, we had what was called the Azusa Street Revival. And, and that's where the modern Pentecostal movement um, came out of the Azusa Street Revival, both Trinitarian Pentecostals and Oneness Pentecostals. And in this time of revival, many miraculous works of God were done. And so this, this Pentecostal movement was born. And in 1913, the Oneness Pentecostal movement emerged, you know, which we are a part of. But about five years after that, and, and about three years after the, the, the Azusa Street revival had petered out, amen, we had the outbreak of the Spanish flu. And so at a time of great revival, immediately after, and, and any time there's revival, expect, you know, some trials. And so this thing came about, this pandemic, and what was happening at the time, you know? Um, well, as I said to you last week, about 50 million people died from this, the, 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 the outbreak. And what was happening at the time? Does this picture look familiar? Because this is a makeshift hospital from that time. And now we have many makeshift hospitals full of, 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 of persons. If you look at the medical staff, wearing masks, etc. So people were dying in droves, just as all people are dying in droves now. It's a similar situation. Look at the frontline um, workers, the police, they were wearing their protective gears, just as all uh, we have to wear protective gear now. So it was a similar situation. So all these PPEs were being worn. Amen. I, I pulled this. Amen. The prime minister posted this, but somebody sent it. Um, and, and I pulled it down from WhatsApp. But this is a public notice that occurred on Thursday, November 7, 1918. And it was the city of Kelowna, which there is a, a, a faith apostolic ministry church there, pastored by Pastor Baptiste. No, but you know, over a hundred years ago, this notice was given. It said, "Notice is hereby given that, in order to prevent the spread of the Spanish influenza, all schools, public and private, churches, theaters, moving picture halls." pool rooms and other places of amusement and lodge meetings are to be closed until further notice. All public gatherings consisting of 10 or, or more are prohibited. So the governor, the mayor signed that in, in order in, on October 19, bless God, 1918. Now that's a similar situation where churches are closed, were prohibited in this country from a meeting in gatherings of more than 10. In some countries, it's, it's more than five. And I think I saw one country where it was more than two or something like that. And um, all forms of, of, of gatherings, you know, not just churches, but, but secular entertainment, amen, and other forms of business, amen, have been impacted. Uh, that's what was happening then, similar to what's happening now. And on a newspaper clipping, it talks, it says, um, you know, there's a ban on funerals in churches. 15 or more die of Spanish influenza. This is those one city so it says disease spreads to Mexican quarters and claims sudden death toll as health officers order discontinuance, public gatherings, and closed pool halls, quarantine between here to here, etc. So it's a similar thing, and, and this was something um, that was distributed in. The, the, the newspaper, uh, this is not Canada now, bless God. And so therefore, you know, I'm just showing that that was a general thing throughout the world. Look at some clips put together. This one says, death brings warning of influenza. Ban on dances is placed by health officer. Voluntary flu ban urge. Schools closed. No services in churches on Sunday. Every precaution to prevent influenza in Covington. Sidewalk slush, flushing or oiling of streets urged by counts of defense. Newport gym classes stop. Funeral ban ordered. Amen. Newport library ordered closed. And so, you know, these are the types of things that we're seeing now. You know, funerals, a colleague of mine passed on and his funeral was said last week and only 64 there. Um, so funerals, uh, and you know, for a wedding that took place last week as well, and only four persons were there. So there is this ban on these gatherings, excuse me, on these gatherings, 
Amen. And it's a similar situation that they were experience in, experiencing in 1918 to 20 that we're experiencing now. Um, this article might be kind of difficult for you to see. I'm going to read it from Bombay, India. It says, in the midst of famine, conditions for the annual rains have failed this year and the raging of an awful pestilence, which is raging quite generally in India. We have many reasons for gratitude to God for this unfailing care, for his unfailing care and faithfulness. This pestilence is taking upwards of a thousand lives daily. At present in Bombay alone, it is called Spanish influenza for a lack of a more accurate term. It is more like pneumonic plague. Anyhow, the throat in first attacked by a germ and then strikes direct the lungs. Pneumonia appears in many cases within 24 hours from the time of the attack. In two or three days, the patient dies. It is worse than any attack or plague India has ever had. And so this report from India says just in Bombay, the capital at that time, uh, that was the name of the capital of, of India at that time. Upwards of a thousand people were dying daily. And we see that in many places, record deaths, a thousand, I think the, the record happened in the US where 2000 people died in a day approximately. And so that is a general situation. Many people are dying in different cities and they attack, they attack on the lungs and the, the pneumonia that sets in. So it's, it was similar conditions to what we're experiencing in COVID. And, you know, one article that I looked at, the writer that wrote in 2020 says 500 million people worldwide contracted the virus and 50 million died as a result. 675,000 in the United States alone. And so the US death toll, I know is above 30,000, I think. Uh, but, you know, this was a terrible, terrible time in the history of the world, amen, in the Spanish influenza. These are some of the things that were happening. Now, what was the early church's response? Uh, from the article, you know, that they were extracted some, some, uh, some clips from the Influence magazine, which was a Pentecostal published paper. Um, so, Assemblies of God, I think. So this is one thing that was written. Um, it says, Jesus said, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. So they were looking to the same scriptures that we're looking at now. The same scripture that I use in part one. Amen. That's the scripture that they use. And they're looking at those who are the signs of the end time. And all mature Bible students believe that we are indeed in the beginning of sorrows. So these are the beginning of sorrows because we're living in this final dispensation. And, the, and when the tribulation comes, um, this will be child's play. And as we heard one recently state, the worst is yet to come. When you look at some of the things that are happening, bless God, that happened in the tribulation, it is in far, indeed, far worse than what we're experiencing now. The events in Genesis, uh, sorry, in Revelation 6 to 19, those are not the events that we're experiencing now. We're not experiencing the events in Revelation 6 to 19. Those events will take place after the rapture. Those events will take place in the tribulation. And so we see, you know, at that time, even a quarter of the earth would be wiped off at one point and, you know, various things. So it would be much worse then. Quarter of the earth is roughly 2 billion people. That, that, that's a lot of, you know, that, that's a lot of death. Amen. And so, but the saints of God need have no fear. And the message is still the same today. As saints, we should not be fearful. They can look up to the heavens and rejoice in the certain knowledge that their redemption right now. And so saints don't need to be fearful. Just as they were in 1918, uh, they recognized that they were in end times. They knew that these were not the tribulation events. And the tribulation events, those from Genesis, uh, rather Revelation 6 to 19, would be much worse. So similar message to what we are preaching at this time. Amen. Look to God as the church. Have faith in God. We are in these end times. God showed us what would happen. But worse is to come. 
but we won't be here because the church will be raptured. Raptured, there is hope. Amen. And another, um, uh, you know, article talks about assemblies being closed. It says here in Springfield, all churches, missions, etc., including the Assembly of God, are closed because of the scourge of the Spanish influenza that is raging in the town. The way to our loving Father's heart and the way to his is hearing air are still open. And this is an important point because even though the churches are closed, we're not barred from praying. God still hears us and God still is open to our cry. And we're finding it a splendid opportunity to, to devote additional time to prayer for our missionaries and for the soldiers, soldier boys, and for the rain all over the world in this time of the latter rain. And so I believe that we're, there, it is now an opportune time for us to pray. We have, we have been given the time, we have been given the space, and we should be doing more praying. Where assemblies are closed, let the saints devote the time they would spend at a meeting to the word and to prayer. Oh my God, these are the two principal things in the Christian life. The basic things, the prayer and the word. If you want to know God, if you want to please him, we need to pray, we need to read and study his word. He whose ears are ever open to the prayers of the secret closet will, before long, bring the open reward. So this was the attitude of the saints. Amen. This is time to pray. We need to believe, you know, we need to utilize this time to do more praying. Bless God. So their churches were close too, but they utilized the time, amen, to draw close to God, amen. And I believe we should do the same. Um, this from Wichita Falls, Texas. It says, we are very glad to report victory for this place. We had begun a revival here and run five nights. Nine had been saved and two baptized in the Holy Ghost. When the plague of influenza began to sweep the town and we had to close down, we had blessed unity. The saints all seemed to have a burden for the lost. Many souls were getting interested, but, were, but we are looking for a blessed time when we begin again. Brother Newby was with us and God blessed him giving out the word. Pray for us. And so this pastor, Oscar Jones, he wrote that in Texas at the time, they, they just had started a revival. Nine persons got saved. It said two baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen. But it seems as if the work was disrupted. But I want you to understand, these things don't disrupt the work of God. They can't. They will not. In this time, I'm seeing, for example, Minister Rowe at, at Bethel, South Camp Road. He baptized last Sunday, baptized several people. And so, therefore, the work of God does not stop. God is in control. God has allowed this to happen. So this is not hindering the work of God. Um, so there were the he's a revival and, 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 and they had to shut down. But let me say something. Uh, you know, we were kind of of sorts having a revival before the shutdown. Because the Sunday before the shutdown, 15 people were baptized at, at, at Faith Chapel. Amen. As somebody told me. And at Majestic, you know, leading up where two people baptized and one person filled with the Holy Ghost. And so it seems as if this effort, this momentum was broken. But God is in charge, as we read earlier in Isaiah. He does all things well. So he had a purpose for doing all of this. Um, in San Francisco, California, this person, Craig, wrote, Wife and I, with a good many of our people, had the Spanish influenza, but the Lord has delivered us all, not one of them died. And so some people are delivered. Some people who get it will be miraculous deliver, miraculously delivered. Over 2,000 perished in this city alone. So when 2,000 people died, all the saints were kept. God is graciously working in both missions now. We feel somehow that we are now on the last lap of the race, and we are striving to finish the work of work God has assigned to us. Pray for us that we may have the vertical look. So you were saying, yes, God was good. God kept them in this particular location. Not one of them died. And they say, you know, pray for us that we continue to look up to God. If I can go back a little in this one, it says, um, you know, they said, we're looking forward to the blessed time when we begin again. You know, can I tell you, this is not a permanent situation. We will begin again. 
we will start to have in our, our mass services again. We will be able to go out as we used to again. Amen. But the work of God still can continue, and I'm going to look at that. This one said, so in one location, no person died. But look at this one. The scattered members were just returning, and our meetings were filling up once more when the order to close was issued by the health department on account of the Spanish influenza. So we have held no meetings for the past month, and we're currently in that situation. But our time has been taken up more than ever in visiting the Christians and those seeking salvation, as well as praying with the sick. So I guess in small numbers, probably less than 10, they did visit the pray with the sick. And we don't have to go physically there to pray for the sick. Amen. It is blessed to see how God is answering prayer in awakening and saving the relatives, friends, and neighbors of those whom the Spirit has taught to pray. And so what we need to be doing is to pray and to pray for all men, our relatives, our friends, people infected can recover. Only one has been taken from us by death, a girl with tubercular tendency who passed away very sudden when attacked by the influenza. And this young lady had an underlying condition and um, tubercular tendency, some things she had, but she died. She was a saint who died. And this was her, her last words. Her last words were, the blood of Jesus is covering me. And we rejoice to know that she's safe with him, washed in that precious blood. We laid her to rest yesterday in sure and certain hope of a glorious resurrection. Hallelujah. Many others have been and are ill, but our great physician is graciously healing them all in answer to prayer. So the bottom line is that the saints were praying. Many of them were protected, as many of us are today. Some were healed, as some have been, and some died, as some have died. And I remember a, a couple of weeks ago when you know, a, a, a UPCI pastor in the U.S. died and some people were shocked. And saints have passed on. There's one saint who were praying for in New York and he passed. Amen. But so it is. Some people have gone home to be with the Lord early and we mourn with them and their families and comfort them. You know, but the good thing is to be saved because death has no power over them, bless God, who are blood washed. So some, you know, a few will die, but God will protect and even heal some of us who will be infected by the disease. Now, in conclusion, where this article was concerned, the article is entitled, How Pentecostal Responded to the 1980 Influenza Pandemic. And it's written by this fellow, Is Grig. Um, it was written on March 18, 2020. Amen. Less than a month ago. So this is what he says. As spirit-empowered believers consider how to respond to the current crisis, there are two things to take away from this historical example. When we look at the example of the 1918 outbreak. First, <clears throat> Early Pentecostals endured the worst flu to that point in history. And it's still the worst flu because uh, the worst pandemic because the, the COVID-19 has not overtaken in terms of number of infections and in terms of death, the death toll. Although, and I like this, they believed in healing. They did not claim that their faith in God would protect them from the disease. And so we do believe in healing, but we know that Based on the will of God, some people will, will get the disease. We see from the scriptures that everyone was healed. You know, Paul had a sickness that he prayed for three times and he was never healed. But he healed many people and even raised um, someone from the dead. His beloved son in the gospel, Timothy, had a sickness of which he was never healed. So sometimes healing is based on the will of God. Well, at all times. Many caught the flu, some died. Yet early Pentecostals continued to proclaim that God was a healer. So whether we are healed or not, God is still a healer. Amen. It all depends on his will. And many were preserved through the flu or healed of it. But God will preserve us. Majority of us, God will preserve us. Some will die, but the will of God will be done. You know, when we look at the, the same God, he allowed James to be killed by Herod. But when the same Herod captured Peter and wanted to do the same, God delivered him miraculously. So it all depends on the will of God. 
In either case, they testify that their faith in God and prayer got them through the crisis. So what is going to get us through this crisis? If we learn anything from Pentecostals in 1918, our faith in God and prayer is what will get us through this crisis. The second thing is that early Pentecostals worship and ministry were interrupted by the crisis. As our form of worship and ministry as we are used to is interrupted now, Missions were closed, our churches are closed, revivals were canceled. Even the publication, the Christian Evangel, was delayed. And, and that's the one that I read from. Yet early Pentecostals followed the guidelines of the city or health department and closed their churches and missions when instructed to. They were not careless with the lives of people during the pandemic. They were willing to stay home and pray, knowing that that was just as valuable in this crisis. Can I tell you one of the greatest work of the church today is prayer. God wants us to pray. We can pray. We are not prohibited from praying. We don't need to meet in mass numbers. Some people are concerned because we're not going to the mass buildings. When I taught this lesson, somebody asks, well, when I get there, I'll talk about that. But can I just let me humbly submit that the word of God is not when the will of God is not being hindered and the work of God is not being hindered because we can do what God wants us to do. The situation is of the Lord. He allowed it. And so we need to respond likewise. We need to maintain our faith. We need to pray and look to God and we need to be obedient to the edicts of the authorities. So what should we then do? And I've said a mouthful before, but what should we do? One, we must maintain our faith in God. We must continue being responsible. We must obey the authorities and protect the lives of the people. And I saw earlier this week where one pastor was defiant of the orders and kept church. He died in the U.S. He got the virus and he died. You know, I saw another case in the media where a, a church, some 60 members of, of a church, um, went and had choir practice and 45 of them got the influenza. And another church that was kept, Amen. Bless God. They too got mass numbers being infected. And so we must protect the lives of, of people. Leaders should be responsible. We must utilize the technology and our meet in small groups that we do not violate the government orders. And that's what we're doing now. Utilize the technology, things like these. And um, having services online, Bible studies, etc. And meeting in small groups. But we must be obedient and we must continue to look to God. Now, the question I put here, can we still have church? Can we still have church? Well, of course. Let's look at what the church is. The, the, in scriptures, the term church was adopted to refer to the body of believers or the community of Christians. That's what the church is, the body of believers. So it, re, it, 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 it refers to the believers in Christ. And we are called the body of Christ. And so the believers, amen, we form the church, the body of Jesus Christ. It consists of people of all races from all nations. And so when you look at the model, you would have churches in individual, um, in, in, in countries in different locations, but it is all one body. Men of all nations, of all races who believe in Jesus Christ and are obedient to his word, make up the church. Amen. What the church is not, it's very important to state this. The church is not a physical building. The church is not a physical building. And I want to state this emphatically. Now, in the scripture, the word that we translate church, ecclesia, occurs 140 times and it never refers to material buildings. It never refers to material buildings, the word church. Amen. And there are various examples. I won't go through all of these in the scriptures. However, the church is a spiritual house, a spiritual temple, a spiritual building. Amen. Bless God. Therefore, the church refers to the people. Amen. So therefore, we do not go to church. That's our common thing. We're going to church. We don't go to church. But the church meets together in a building. And so th that's the terminology that was used in scripture. The church at Corinth, the church in Rome, the church which met in so-and-so's house. Amen. So the church which meets under the tent, the church that meets at, at Majestic Temple, the church that meets at Ascot, amen. The church that meets at Pentecostal, Tamanakan, Wildman Street, etc. 
Um, the church that meets on Lindus Road, Shiloh. The church that meets on South Camp Road. So the church refers to the people and not the building. Amen. We don't have to go to a physical building. Amen. To have church and to be the church. Now, what was the early church model? I want to look at this. The first century church, which is, is the most, I can say, you know, arguably the most successful church. We look at the first century church, the model, amen. And everybody wants to see the power of the first century church, the effectiveness, amen, of the first century church. Everybody wants to see that today. But look at the model. There was no one church in a city. Within a city, as we read, there were many congregations. Sorry, there was one church in a city, but there were many congregations that made up that one church. So when it says the church of Antioch, in the city of Antioch, it was referred to as one church, but that consisted of many different locations. Amen. And so there were elders. The Bible normally talks about the elders of the church. And so there were leaders, amen, pastors of the different locations. And there was, you know, a presiding bishop, so to speak, of the entire work. There were no buildings large enough to house the many believers. Generally speaking, so they met in homes. So what you find happening, and I found from the same source and many others, I'm just quoting this one, is that the people in the early church, and that was the early model, they met, met, met in homes. Look at Acts, they went from house to house. Amen. Bless God, they met in homes. And so they would meet in several homes in a city. Amen. And this formed the church <clears throat> in the city. Bless God. So the, the structure that we have now, if it stands from the early church, if Paul should come and Peter, and they should look what we have as church now, they'd be shocked because it's totally different. The thing has evolved. But they, they didn't own any large buildings for them to meet together. Um, we know Paul went to the synagogues and preached to the Jews, and then when he was rejected, he went to the Gentiles. Amen. So the synagogues were run by the Jews, but the, the Christians... Amen. They didn't own the buildings and, and they were largely poor people. And so they met in homes. Amen. And so let's look at some examples of this. In, in Romans 6, 16, 5, it says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epanetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. So in Romans here, he, he wrote to Romans and spoke of the church in their house. The people there were churches in houses, meaning people met in houses, and that made up the church of Rome. The churches of Asia greet you. Now here the plural is used because of the many different locations. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. And so these people didn't have mansions that were as big as a stadium to host a lot of people. So they met in small groups. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphas, and the church that is in his house. Amen. In Philemon as well, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in his house. So what we find happening is that the church met in individuals' homes. These are just some of the examples. There were small groups, and they met in homes, but yet they were very effective. Bless God. As a matter of fact, Remember what Jesus said? He said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of blessed. And so the truth is, saints of God, two or three gathered together, that's a church meeting. And we, are, we, we, are, we have been limited to 10 and under, which 10 persons, amen, bless God. When you look at two or three, you're looking at, amen, three and a third to five times more than what God said is required. Amen. So we don't need to despair because we can't meet in our big numbers of hundreds. Amen. Bless God. Our big numbers. Bless God. Of tens. Bless God. So we can still have church. We can still carry the functions. We can still be effective. So under these conditions, meeting in small groups, many small groups, the church, amen, was effective. The church flourished under these conditions. We can be in our small groups and the church flourish and people are saved. Amen. And probably this is a time to revisit that model. Bless God. So we don't need big buildings. We don't need large numbers to do the work of God or to be effective. That's the point that I'm trying to make. There's an added blessing. Technology. 
Let's utilize the technology to meet and to evangelize. I know one church in Canada who is currently even, who, who had the communion via online modality and others are doing it. So, you know, there are things that we can do. In 1980, they didn't have the technology and people stayed home and pray. We can stay home and pray, but the technology can allow us to meet and other people can join in and we can have far, a far reach, you know, bless God, based on the technology and say people can join us on the technology and people can get saved, people can get filled. I heard of an instance where one person even got the Holy Ghost. They were meeting via Zoom and somebody was filled. Amen. And so therefore, these things can happen. So I looked at the Global Digital Report for 2019. I'm going to share some stats. Now it says, this, you know, was printed, amen, January 2019. The, the total population of the world, seven, roughly 7.7 .7 billion people. Amen. And um, urbanization, roughly 56% of that. Those unique mobile users, there are 5.112 billion people that use mobile phones. And this is 67% of the world's population. Use of the internet, the penetration is 57%. Four point, roughly 4.4 billion people in the world have access to the internet. Social media, 45% of the world's population is, is on social media. Roughly 3.5 billion people are on social media. Amen. So mobile social media users, amen. People using their social media on the mobile devices, 42%. Roughly 3.3 billion people, amen. And so this is the reach. This is the world at our fingertips. We can, amen, reach roughly 70% of the world's population just via the technology. And then those who don't have the technology, we can reach them in our small groups. Amen. Be it at work, be it in our community, our small groups. And so the work of God is not in that. Somebody asked the question, what about that 30% that don't have the technology? Well, you know, as I said, the 30%, we can reach them. Amen. Bless God on, on that small one-to-one -one basis. But remember this, that 30% and, in, and indeed the, ent the entire population had access to churches when they were open. Did they choose to come? And so we have to be careful. Now many, many people where I am at want to come to church. People who used to invite the church, people said they went come, people hide us. One man came because he was invited and he slipped out quickly. And that man has been calling, you know, wanting, you know, to come to church when his church going to, be open. And so, because this is of God and God has everything under control, those who should be saved will be saved. And it might sound harsh, but those who should be reached, they will be reached. And so, we can utilize the technology to extend our reach. Now, I want, I've added this slide um, that I didn't have when I taught the original lesson. What the COVID-19 is not. I'm going to tell you what it is not. One, COVID-19 is not an attack on the church or persecution of the church. COVID-19 is not an attack or persecution of the church. Why? The church is not being singled out. If you look in scriptures, amen. When the church is attacked, the church is being singled out. Even in Daniel, when they wanted them to bow down and worship, um, Bless God, don't, not to worship any other God, and he was cast in the den of lions. This thing came about because men had targeted Daniel. Other people were affected, but they knew that other people would not have a problem. But Daniel would definitely, because he was obedient to God. So this was an attack on, on him, amen, on his religion. But in this case, the church is not being singled out. The practices of the church have not been forbidden. We're not being told, we're, not, we're only restricted in numbers, so we can still work. We've not been told not to preach the name of Jesus Christ. We're not being told not to pray, not to read our Bible. As in persecution in former times, people have been told. We're not being told not to send out the gospel. We can do it via social media. Last week I looked at, at that is the empowering factor, via Facebook, via YouTube, whatever. We can reach out to people via Twitter. Amen. We can call people on our mobile phones, etc. And so 
the work of God can continue. We're not, we're not, the, the government has not stopped us from praying or from doing anything that is Christian. We're only restricted in numbers. And as we saw in the early church, in small numbers, probably 10 or less, because how big is a host. Amen. They were very effective and the church would flourish. It is a situation which affects the entire world. So we can't see it as, as persecution of the Christian when all religions are affected. Well, Hindus could say they are being persecuted. Muslims could say they are being persecuted. And every other group for, uh, you know, for, the, for, the, for that fact. Um, all human systems are impacted. Not just churches are closed down. The entire education system is shut down. The examining bodies were looking. What will happen with CSEC? I, I know for a fact that all universities you know, and colleges in Jamaica have been impacted. They are put off exams. They are saying that the students are going to be assessed by a final project. All entertainment has been affected. The sports arena, which is a multi-billion dollar business, has been affected. Businesses have been scaled back and shut down. The government are keeping a few things afloat so that the economy doesn't shut down fully. Many people are, are losing jobs. In the U.S. alone, I don't know figures of Jamaica, but in four weeks, over 22 million people have lost their jobs in the U.S. And so the, all systems have been affected. So it's not just the church. Even the evil are impacted because Freemasons can have their meeting. We saw in 1980, large meetings were, were closed down. The Illuminati, witchcraft workers, they can, you know, meet in their big thing to do their thing. So um, everyone has been impacted by this. So if it is a persecution, it's a persecution for the entire earth. So it's not only the church. We can't just keep on blinkers. We have to look at the, the entire picture. We have to take a panoramic view and see what's happening. So the church is not being persecuted. Amen. Bless God. So the final word, as I close off, let's accept what the Lord is doing. That should be capital L for Lord. Let's accept this thing. God has allowed it for a purpose. And let's pray that his purpose be done. Let's accept the situation that we're in. And what we need to do is adopt, you know, well, we need to, we need to, um, we, need, we need to change our methods. The gospel remains the same. The message remains the same. We probably need to change our methods. That some of the things that we use to, 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 to get out, you know, we need to adapt to the situation. Amen. We need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift us up. We, don't, we should not be rebellious. Amen. We should not be fearful. Amen. The Bible says, The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for, for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Saints, God will deliver you. God will keep you. God will preserve you for his kingdom. And that brings the lesson to an end. Amen. Bless God. Um, if you have any questions, and I guess you can email them to me. You can email your questions to faithmajestictemple at gmail.com. So just as it as is, as spelled out, faithmajestictemple at gmail.com. God bless you. Amen. And uh, we will put out more videos. Amen. So um, as we seek to keep you informed, as we seek to spread the gospel. Amen. So until next time, this is Brother King signing out in Jesus' name. Amen.